بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته My brothers and sisters in Islam alhamdulillah we are on the last part part number 3 of surah al-fath which is the surah of victory that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed surah number 48 in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the treaty of Hudaybiyah lots of seerah lots of history in this beautiful surah yesterday we took how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the mukhallafin those who stayed back and how they gave various excuses and how they gave all sorts of uh, reasons why they did not join rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and how the how the quran rebukes them corrects them and told them that the real reason that they did not join was that they did not have faith in allah did not have good thoughts about him and how ultimately allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not going to make them from those people who won the reward of the khaybar and khaybar was only for those sahaba that were with rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam were ready to sacrifice themselves with rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and ultimately this is the reward of those people who struggle and are the first to offer their lives for the sake of Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them eternal blessings in this dunya and the akhirah also we spoke about how if you work for the akhirah Allah gives you the dunya alhamdulillah the sahaba worked for their akhirah left their dunya for the akhirah following the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the dunya uh, and khaybar was theirs now in this final part of uh, surah al hujurah of, of uh, surah al fath Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to talk about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the sahaba that the sahaba or some people amongst the sahaba where it was possible that they might have been taunted by the kuffar into a fight remember when the disbelievers came and started taunting the, the sahaba to want to fight it may be that if Allah did not safeguard them give them peace and serenity in their hearts it might have caused them to actually go back and actually harm the believers harm uh, or start a fight if they did that yes it may be that they might have won yeah because Allah's help would have come but here would be, would have been the problem that do you know that there would be other people in Mecca who are dependent on on hiding their religion meaning many people in Mecca had already accepted Islam and if it had been that the the kuffa were fought the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then lost and then they came back to makkah they would have then found out these people struggled to find out who amongst them are hidden and would have tried to harm them and this is why allah azza wa jalla in this beautiful part of the surah allah will talk about how everyone is not only responsible for their deeds everyone is responsible for how other people will behave looking at them so not only am i responsible for my deeds but i am responsible how you will behave once you look at me behaving in a particular way so alhamdulillah if i am teaching islam and then you will say you know what i wish i wish i can also be a teacher one day then this is a good deed for me as well even though i never told you to be a teacher but you behaved in that manner by looking at me correct but in the same way if i am for example smoking or you know being with girls for example and then you saw me behaving in that manner you say oh you look at this guy he's with girls you know what i'll be with girls too then if that is the case then even though i didn't tell you to waste your time with with uh, with girls then you would have done the same thing you would have been sin i would have been sinful for you behaving after seeing that from me so this is what allah subhanahu will say finally allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will talk about how these people in quraish were given a lot of hamiya hamiya meaning a lot of jealousy and anger and hatred and emotion and this is the hamiya that caused them to try to taunt you but were it not been for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sakina and mercy then you would have been taunted and fallen into it finally allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will talk about how indeed the prophet sallam did see the, the the truth in his dream allah will indeed help the prophet sallam complete his dream which is allah will let him perform his umrah and complete the umrah that he is meant to do the very next year and indeed allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not send rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam except as a guide and a mercy to this dunya finally allah will end the surah 
on the last page by talking about who Rasulullah is and who are the people with him. Beautiful description. Muhammadun Rasulullah. Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. Beautiful description of who the companions are so that you can understand who we should aspire to become, how we should aspire to be. طيب. So we have a very small section of the Surah Al-Fatih left, but so full of seerah and so full of meaning, inshallah. Let's get started. So we are on verse number 24 of Surah Al-Fatih, Surah number 48. وَهُوَ الَّذِي كَفَّ أَيْدِيَهُمْ عَنْكُمْ And it is he who has stopped their hands from you. كَفَّ أَيْدِيَهُمْ Kaffa meaning to stop or to block. أَيْدِيَهُمْ Aidi is a plural of yad. So أَيْدِيَهُمْ meaning their hands عَنْكُمْ from you. وَأَيْدِيَكُمْ عَنْهُمْ And your hands from them. Meaning it is Allah who stopped you from fighting. Had it been left up to you both and left up to the emotional behavior the human beings have, yeah? And the way human beings behave when they're taunted and sworn at, then you would have both fought and this would have led to a musibah. But it is Allah who stopped you from fighting. Bi batni Makkah, in the stomach of Makkah or the belly of Makkah. What is the belly of Makkah? Hudaybiyah is called the batni Makkah. Why? Because Makkah would finish and there would be a valley and that is the valley of Hudaybiyah and that was the Batni Makkah. In the valley of Makkah, مِن بَعْدِ أَنْ أَظْفَرَكُمْ عَلَيْهِمْ After he had given you success over them. When is, what is Allah referring to here? Remember we said that two separate groups of the Quraysh came to taunt the believers. One came at night, remember that? They pelted them with stones, there was 50 of them or 70 as some scholars said pelted the Sahaba with stones, threw some arrows at them, but the Sahaba cornered them, right? Second group came in the morning, there was about 30 of them, they started swearing at the Sahaba, they started pelting with stones, and the Sahaba cornered them as well. So this is what Allah is saying, that it is Allah who stopped you from harming them and them from harming you, when you had cornered them on the belly of Makkah, after Allah Azawajal gave you success over them. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرًا Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is well aware of what you do. Meaning, be thankful to Allah. That had it been left up to you, you would have been in jihad and battle. And this might have led to a bad end. Because look at it this way, brothers and sisters. And this is why we have to really think hard. We have to pick our battles correct. This verse makes me think of a strategy. You know, battle strategy. Never ever pick a battle when you cannot win the next battle that will be caused by this battle. <laughs> okay? So when you fight a battle, you know that the enemy is going to react. It's going to cause them to fight another battle. If you cannot fight that and defend yourself when they fight back, then do not start the first battle itself. Does that make sense? And this is why it was said that Pearl Harbor, when Pearl Harbor happened, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, Soon after, America woke up and joined the Second World War. But the Japanese weren't ready for that. They only wanted to create the first harm. And that was out of lack of thought, more out of emotion, more out of anger, more out of hatred for the, for the, for the Americans. So they bombed Pearl Harbor. But when they bombed Pearl Harbor, America woke up. And this then led to, of course, a war until America then threw the, the nuclear bomb the atomic bomb on Japan, yes? So if you cannot stop yourself from the second war, now don't fight the first war. So this is what Allah is teaching a strategy in this verse. It is they, whom? Alladina, those who, kafaru, those who are disbelieved. وصدوكم, and have stopped you عن, from al-masjid al-haram, from the Masjid al-Haram, which is, which is what? Which is Makkah. Ah, this verse is an evidence that all of Makkah is Masjid al-Haram. Because where were the Sahaba embanked? Did you notice where they were, where were they camped? In Hudaybiyah, right? And we said Hudaybiyah is just outside the, just outside the borders of Makkah. So therefore, if Allah is saying that they have stopped you from Masjid al-Haram, 
That means they've stopped you from Makkah. That means all of Makkah is Masjid al-Haram, right? This is why, brothers and sisters in Islam, and there are many other evidences that show that all of Makkah is Masjid al-Haram, such as in Surah al-Isra, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Subhana ladhi asra bi abdihi laylam min al-Masjid al-Haram ila al-Masjid al-Aqsa al-Lati barakna hawlahu li nuriyahu min ayatina, right? Glory be to the one who has taken you, taken his slave from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. But where was Rasulullah on the night of Isra' al-Miraj? Was he in the Makkah Masjid itself? Where's, where was he? He was in the house of someone else. Someone else's home in Makkah, but not in the Masjid al-Haram. So therefore we know that therefore all of Makkah is considered Masjid al-Haram. What does that mean? It means that if you pray any prayer anywhere in Makkah, inside Makkah, two rakahs, it is equal to 100,000 prayers in all of Makkah. Even if you pray in your hotel room, even if you pray in your hotel room, and it's for this reason why the scholars encourage women to pray in their hotel room. Because first of all, they're not obliged to go to the masjid. Secondly, on top of that, the hotel room is actually a hundred thousand prayers, not just the hotel room. As soon as you enter into Makkah, it's a hundred thousand prayers. But did you understand why? Because Allah said so here. He says, kafaru wa sadduqum al Masjid al Haram. They are the ones who are disbelieving and stopping you from entering Masjid al Haram. But they stop them from entering Makkah. That must mean Makkah is Masjid al Haram, right? Very good. There's many other evidences that show that Makkah is Masjid al Haram. From those evidences, is that in the last Hajj, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when he was coming back from Mina to Makkah to perform his tawaf and his sa'i, he was only about 100 meters away from Masjid al Haram, the actual masjid, the actual masjid, yeah, 100 meters away. Dhuhr time came, he stopped and he prayed Dhuhr. Now, would you agree? If you're only about 100 meters away, it makes no sense if the reward is going to be from here to there is going to be 100,000. Why wouldn't you just make this distance, right? And pray the 100,000. But the fact that the Prophet decided to pray just outside the Masjid al-Haram, actual, actual Masjid itself, showed that, you know what? Inside and outside is the same reward. Does that make sense? Right. The third evidence. The third evidence is in some books of the Seerah, it is narrated that when the Prophet ﷺ had actually encamped in the battle in the, in the plains of Hudaybiyah, when it come to, to Salah time, he would actually take the Sahaba, the 1400 Sahaba, moved a little bit into Makkah. He would actually go inside the boundary of Makkah, pray his Dhuhr and come out to where he was embanked in Hudaybiyah. Does that make sense? His Salah, he made it inside Makkah, but then encamping, he made it outside of Makkah. What does that mean? It means, Ikhwani, that you know what? All of Makkah is. <laughs> At least all of Makkah has a blessing that outside of Makkah does not have, correct? And that's why, brothers and sisters in Islam, Makkah is special. Makkah is special. It's a haram. And why is it called the haram? It's called haram because it's haram to take swords and fight in there. It's haram to chain up animals. Like, for example, you can't have a chained animal or a caged animal. It's haram to steal. Of course, it's always haram to steal. But also haram to pick up a stolen object or a haram to, to pick up a lost and found item. It's haram. If you find a purse there in, near the Kaaba, don't you dare pick it up. You cannot pick it up. You just tell the police, hey, listen, this is lost and found item, but you cannot touch it. Yeah? You cannot also allow your sheep to graze in Makkah. You cannot pull a tree you cannot cut, cut a tree, not allowed. Wow. You cannot hunt animals in Makkah. So you can't hunt any of the birds, grab the pigeon and then, you know, barbecue and eat it. No, you can't. Makkah is a haram. Not only for Muslimin, not only for insan and jinn, but also for all of mankind. This is why, Ikhwani, it's so great. And that's why when you go to Makkah for Hajj and Umrah, be careful. Do not do haram. Sisters, Wear hijab properly. Brothers, don't smoke. Do everything right in these places because a small sin can become a massive sin in the eyes of Allah. 
in the boundaries of Makkah. Taib. They are the ones who disbelieved. وَصَدُّوكُمْ And they prevented you عَلِ الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ From the Masjid Al-Haram. Why is it called Masjid Al-Haram? Because a lot of things are haram there. وَالْهَدِي And also the Hadi. Hadi is the sacrificial animal that is sacrificed in Makkah by Mu'tamireen and Hujjaj. So when you go for Hajj and Umrah, if you offer a sacrifice inside Makkah, it's called Hadi. Okay? If you offer a sacrifice here, it's called an Udhiya. But inside of Makkah, it's called a Hadi. Does that make sense? Alright, so if we do a sacrifice now, have you done your Udhiya? Have you done your Udhiya? We say at you know, Eid al-Adha time. We say, have you done your Udhiya? Where is your Udhiya? And here you go guys, 300 ring, 300 ring for Udhiya. Yeah? So that's called Udhiya. But inside Makkah is called Hadi. Why is it called Hadi? Because it comes from the word Huda. Because it guides. It's a guide to Allah Azawajal. Also it's called the Hadi because it's a gift to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. You're giving a gift to Rabbil Izzat Wal Jalal. And so, Wal Hadi, and that is a sacrifice that is done in Makkah, Ma'akufan, Meaning that has been consecrated purely for Allah. Ayyabluga mahilla. Meaning they are the ones. The Quraysh is the one who stopped you from entering Makkah. And they have stopped the hadi, the sacrificial animal from reaching its place. Ayyabluga mahilla. From reaching its place, meaning reaching Makkah where it should be slaughtered inside Makkah. Walawla rijalun. And if it wasn't for the rijal, men, mu'minun. Believing men, wanisa u mu'minat, and believing women, lam ta'lamuhum, you don't know who they are, an tata'uhum, that you should cause them some harm, fa tusibakum, minhum ma'arratan bi ghayri'in. And if it were not for these believing men and believing women, you don't know who they are, but because of your actions, they would have had some sort of harm. What is Allah talking about here? Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have let you fight them. And they are the ones who stopped you from, from, from the haram. They are the ones who are stopping the hadith from being, going to Makkah. And all of this is great dhulm with Allah. And had it not been, had it not been that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was trying to protect a group of people that had accepted Islam, men and women, who were in Makkah, who had accepted Islam, but the Sahaba did not know who they are. But the Quraysh had a thinking that they knew who they are that the Quraysh would come and harm them, had it not been this cause, Allah would have allowed you to fight them. Does that make sense? Meaning that had you fought them, it may have been your actions would have led to these innocent people being harmed. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us two or three different important points of benefit here. Point, first point of benefit is that Yehwati, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected these people who had hidden their faith. Right? And one way of protecting is that Allah stopped the Nabi from fighting a jihad. So as you can see how much is the protection of Allah for believers. You know, I still remember when, um, uh, when the tsunami happened. Does anyone remember the tsunami in the 2005? The big tsunami that happened? And people were asking, why did the tsunami happen? And you think about it, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped the Muslim ummah in many ways. Do you remember at that time, the war drums were, were being beaten by George Bush at that time, Jr. George Bush Jr. was beating the war drums at that time to take over another Islamic country. He had just attacked Iraq. He wanted to now attack, he had attacked Afghanistan, Iraq, and now he was beating the war drums over other Islamic countries to take them over as well. So when the tsunami came, the total tide changed. No one wanted a war, everyone wanted peace because suddenly the attention of humanity had turned towards being good to each other because of the fact that the tsunami had brought so much difficulty and harm, and, and harm upon humanity. Also, Ikhwani, brothers and sisters in Islam, remember this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects people just like He's protecting these people by even stopping them from fighting jihad because that might have led to them being harmed. Second point of benefit, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that had you fought them that these believing men and believing women who you don't know 
am tata'uhum you would have harmed them fatusibakum so it would have reached you ma'arratan meaning bad thoughts about you would have come to people people would have said bad things about you you would have got a disreputation you would have got a bad reputation ma'arratan bi ghayri ilm which you would have done without knowledge because of the fact that you ended up doing an action that had a repercussion so the point of benefit that I want to point out is that brothers and sisters, we are all responsible for how we behave and how people behave back to us based upon our behavior. Does that make sense? This is such an important point. So if I'm good to you based upon this, you also become good to your children, then that is also from my deeds. But if I'm bad to you, rude to you, based upon this, you're rude back to your children, then you know what? It is from my deeds as well. And this is why, brothers and sisters, you know, have you heard of how people who, who speak about parenting, they say that there's a reason why the eldest son is bad with the, with the younger children. It's perhaps because they saw the mother and the father arguing, or the father being bad to the mother, or the mother being bad to the father. So the eldest children think that they can also behave like that to the younger children. Have you, have you heard of that? Yes or no? Makes sense, right? Logical sense? Absolutely. This is why never ever misbehave in front of your children. Never misbehave in front of anyone for that matter. Because if other people misbehave looking at you, then you are liable for that too. So subhanAllah, this shows you, Ikhwani, how many things are we going to find written on our book of deeds on the Day of Judgment when we're going to say, Ya Rab, I never did this. Why is it in my book? Yes, but you did one deed and someone saw you doing it and as a result, they're here. So this is why today with social media, you know how we spread our sins today on social media. And you know, for example, a sister puts on a lot of makeup and then she takes a selfie of herself. She takes a selfie of herself. She sends it to a million people. You know, what are you expecting? First of all, imagine how many other girls are going to do the same thing looking at you. Imagine how many boys are going to fantasize about you. Imagine how many haram you're going to lead to, correct? Why would you do that? Why would you do that? This is why brothers and sisters, we have the tools to our own destruction today. It's in our pocket, it's called the mobile phone. And wallahi, we can cause so much harm to ourselves or so much good to ourselves. Right. <laughs> So that Allah may enter into his mercy, whoever he wills. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected these innocent people. Even though you did not realize it, your actions might have hurt them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected these innocent people by stopping you from fighting the Quraysh. And if they transgress the boundaries, then indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have caused them to have a severe punishment, those who disbelieve to have a severe punishment in this dunya and the akhirah. Meaning if they had come back and despite you not fighting them, if they decided to take harm upon these innocent Muslimin back in, back in Makkah, Allah would have then surely punished them with the punishment from Himself. If جَعَلَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُ Remember when those who disbelieved, they had in their hearts, كَفَرُوا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ In their hearts, they had hamiyya. What's hamiyya? Hamiyya is the emotional fire. You know, when you, uh, when you saw, for example, what Israel was doing to Palestine, then you end up having that fire in your belly. That's called the Hamiyya. But the Hamiyya that Allah is talking about here is different. He is talking about the Hamiyya of Jahiliyyah. Hamiyyatul Jahiliyyah is that sort of fire in your belly, which is not based upon truth. It's based upon falsehood. It's based upon jealousy. It's based upon anger. It's based upon hatred. It's based upon racial division. Does that make sense? So imagine those people who are racially motivated. Like for example, the slave owners of America when they used to kill their slaves. Or for example, the imperial lords when they used to harm their people that they used to rule over. 
or the kings of Egypt when they used to kill the Banu Israel, when they did it out of pride and anger and jealousy, not out of at all, out of uh, you know something which is true and truthful. This is called the Hamiyat al Jahiliya. إِذْ جَعَلَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ Remember what the disbelievers had in their hearts. Hamiyah. Hamiyah al-Jahiliyah. The, the ignorant Hamiyah. The ignorant emotional behavior. فَأَنزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down. Sent down meaning from up to down. That must mean Allah is up. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down سَكِينَتَهُ His peace and His tranquility. عَلَى رَسُولِهِ Upon His messengers. وَعَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And upon the believers. وَأَلْزَمَهُمْ كَلِمَةَ التَّقْوَى And he forced upon them the word of taqwa. مَا مَانَا كَلِمَةَ التَّقْوَى قَالَ السَّلَفُ الصَّالِحِ The righteous pious predecessors. They said, كَلِمَةَ التَّقْوَى يَعْنِ أَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ Others said, كَلِمَةَ التَّقْوَى لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Right? Others said, كَلِمَةَ التَّقْوَى حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَالنِّعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ Right? Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Meaning Allah is enough for us, enough is He a protector for us. Right? So this is kalimat al-taqwa, meaning dhikr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, instead of, you know when you get angry, when you get really angry, and you want to do something about it, what's the best way to channel it? If you're standing, sit down. If you're sitting, lie down. If you don't have wudu, go and make wudu. Right? And make dhikr with your mouth. Give the adhan. Make dhikr with your mouth. Do not let shaitan take the better of your anger. So dhikr decreases your anger. Decreases the hamiya that you have within yourselves. And alhamdulillah, <coughs> this is the kalimat al-taqwa. This is the, uh, this is the kalimat al-taqwa that gave sakina to the believers in their hearts. وَكَانُوا أَحَقَّ بِهَا وَأَهْلَهَا and they are more worthy of kalimat al-taqwa and they are the people of kalimat al-taqwa. Meaning, who? The sahaba. They are the people of dhikr. And they are more worthy of it and they are its true people. وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is most knowledgeable about all affairs. لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْحَقِّ Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala moves on to talking about the dream that the Prophet ﷺ saw, that originally started this whole story. In the sixth year of Hijrah, one day, one night, the Prophet went to sleep and he saw that he was performing Umrah, correct? That's when everything started, right? That's when everything, the whole story started. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, this dream was a true dream. لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْحَقِّ Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has indeed indeed attested to the truthfulness and the authenticity of the dream that the Prophet ﷺ had seen. And he promises, لَتَدْخُلَنَّ لَتَدْخُلَنَّ means that you will offer surety most definitely. And over here, يعني تدخل تدخلنّ it has two different adat two different forms that are added to this word to add definiteness to it. The first is Lam. La, which is Lam at taqeed La tadkhul means most definitely you'll enter. But when you add the Noon, Tanween at the end of it, Tadkhulanna, the Noon at the end, double Noon, Shadda at the end, that becomes taqeed upon taqeed meaning most definitely, of a surety, there's no doubt about it, you'll definitely enter. Does that make sense? It's affirmation upon affirmation, definiteness upon definiteness. Right. لَتَدْخُلَنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ Haram. You will most definitely enter Masjid al-Haram. What is Masjid al-Haram here? Makkah. Yeah. You will most definitely enter Makkah, Masjid al-Haram. Allah. By the will of Allah. Yeah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us good manners. وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدَى إِلَّا إِيَّا شَاءَ اللَّهِ Never ever say I'm going to do something tomorrow except that you say inshaAllah. Okay? So ikhwani, by the way, you know this inshaAllah? 
we don't know when to say it. Some people say it at the wrong times. Have you heard of the inshallah disease? It's not a disease, it's called the inshallah bug. Some people is like, how are you doing inshallah? I'm doing really well inshallah. How was your food? Very good inshallah. <laughs> Allah have mercy on you inshallah. I said, see you tomorrow inshallah. Okay, so which one was the right one by the way? Only the last one was right. <laughs> see you tomorrow inshallah. But how are you doing inshallah means makes no sense. Uh, I'm doing well inshallah. Also makes no sense. Uh, Allah have mercy on you inshallah. Also makes no sense. Also doesn't make sense. You shouldn't say inshallah in dua. You should not say inshallah in dua. You should only say inshallah for actions in the future. Correct? Not for dua. Don't say, may Allah give you jannah inshallah. You know when someone says that to me, I said, hey, you come here. Come here. <laughs> Sit down here. Okay? Let me read the Quran on you. <laughs> Is it the shaitan making you say the inshallah the wrong time? You know, your brother, when you make dua for him, you never say inshallah. Say, oh Allah, give him jannah. Ameen. Don't say inshallah at that point. Okay? That's where you say ameen, not inshallah. Does that make sense? Okay, so please don't abuse the word inshallah whenever you want. Inshallah is only for actions in the future. Tayyip. لَتَدْخُلَنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامَ inshallah. Aminin. Aminin meaning in protection. You will not be afraid of anyone. Full protection, full security. Aminin. Muhalliqeen ru'usakum. Muhalliqeen, halq is to shave. Muhalliqeen, those who had shaved their heads. Muhalliqeen ru'usakum. Muhalliqeen, those who had shaved ru'usakum, their heads. Wa muqassireen, and those who cut. So he mentions the shave before the cut. Why does he do that? Because shaving the head has more reward than the cutting. Number two, because the men will shave and the female will cut. Right? And because a male are ge gender are usually mentioned before the female gender, right? So Allah mentions Muhalliqeen, Ru'usakum wa Muqassireen, La Takhafoon. You will not fear anyone at all. Tayyib Ikhwani, this verse has been used by some scholars to say you should not shave your head in any other time other than Hajj and Umrah. This verse was used by some scholars to say, you know how sometimes we're like, you know what, I like my hair, but. I think I'm going to go for the bald look. How about it? Would you guys like to feature other you the bald look? Yeah, the bald look and the will, you know, I'll, uh, what is it? Uh, you know, you put oil and whatever, nice, you know? So that it shines, the bald look. No, bald look we shouldn't go for because the Prophet had hair and he never shaved his head except in Hajj and Umrah. And the Prophet's hair was up to his shoulders, by the way. Some said up to his earlobe, past his shoulder. And he used to wear his hair back. And this is reported by Ibn Abdul Bar that he used to wear his hair back, comb his hair back, sometimes to the left, sometimes to the right, depending on Makkah, Medina, wherever he was. But in general, his hair was combed back all the way, long hair. So if it fell, it would come down. And he would then roll it all back up here. Not that, you know, he would tie it into a ponytail or like what we do today. No, 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 don't do that stuff. Okay? But have, you can have long hair. This is from the Sunnah of the Prophet. What about short hair, by the way? Why do I have short hair? when the Prophet had long hair. What's going on, Tawfiq? Well, uh, <clears throat> the answer is very simple. We know that the Prophet ﷺ wore his hair based upon muru'a, based upon the customs of the people. If he was in Makkah, he followed the way of the Muslimin against the way of the Mushrikeen. Mushrikeen combed from the right to the left, so he combed from the left to the right. When he went to Medina, he saw that the Jews combed from the left to the right, so he combed from the right to the left to be different from the Jews. Can you see how subhanAllah Rasulullah says, always try to be different? I mean, what's wrong that today we try to follow Justin Bieber and whoever else all the time? Why are you following these fools, man, by the way? Yeah, why are you following these guys? Why are people following these guys rather than following Allah and His Messenger and trying to be different? Our religion always teaches us to be different. Tayyip. لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْحَقِّ لَتَدْخُلَنَّ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامِ Insha'Allah, Amin. In protection, Muhalliqin ruusakum wa muqassirin, la taqafun, and you will not be afraid of anything except Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Fa'alima ma lam ta'lamu. So he knew what you don't know. Meaning, he knew 
that what is better for you is not to do Umrah now. What is better for you is to go do the Umrah or try to do the Umrah and come back, but use that as, an, as a means of forcing Quraysh into a negotiation, into something which will cause you to grow, which is the Hudaybiyah Treaty. So he knew that which you don't know. So he has made other than this, meaning other than allowing you to enter into Makkah and doing Umrah, he is going to give you another near victory. Fathan Qariba. Which one is Fathan Qariba? Fathan Ba'ida is Makkah because this is in sixth year of Hijrah, this verse was revealed. So in two years, that's going to be the real Fath. But Fathan Qariba is Khaybar. Okay? So remember, Ikhwani, you need two things in order for any message to spread. What do you need? Or three things. You need an idea, you need money, and you need people. Correct or not? You need an idea, money, and people. Rasulullah Sallam had the idea, it's Islam. You needed money, so Allah gave him money, which is Khaybar. When Khaybar came, they were so wealthy. Never to be unwealthy anymore. Remember I said some of the scholars counted how much each Sahaba got? And we, we said that some of the scholars counted each Sahaba got no less than half a million dollars. Equivalent. Amazing amount of wealth. Right? For doing what? For only promising that they will sacrifice Allah for the sake of Allah. Allah gave him this reward. The third thing they needed was people. So Allah gave them people. How did Allah give him people? By the fact that when Makkah was overtaken, everyone accepted Islam. So they had money, they had people, they had an idea then that's how they had a movement, that's how they had Islam spread everywhere. Make sense? Tayyip. So, فَجَعَلَ مِن دُونِ ذَٰلِكَ فَتْحًا قَرِيبًا So he has given, apart from this, a near victory. هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ It is he who sent his messenger. بِالْهُدَى With guidance. وَدِينِ الْحَقِّ And with the religion of truth. لِيُظْهِرَهُ In order to make it supreme. عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّهِ Upon all religions. وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ شَهِيدًا Allah is enough a witness over what He says. Ikhwani, what does this verse mean? This verse means the future is for Islam. Because Allah said Rasulullah not to be rejected and cursed. He said Rasulullah to make His deen and Islam supreme over all religions. Today is Islam supreme over all religions? No. Only one in five is a Muslim. One in four is an atheist. One in three is a Christian. One in four is an atheist. Do you know that? And one in three is a Christian today. So Islam is not supreme. That means a day will come when Islam will become supreme. And that day is near and it will happen. There is no doubt about it. And that's why I want to tell you some hadith of Rasulullah you might not have heard before. In Mustad Imam Ahmed and Tabarani, the Prophet Sallallahu said, the last hour will not come until India is conquered. So some of the scholars said, India has conquered. What about the Mughals? The Mughals who ruled over India, Muslims, that came from Afghanistan and Iran and Persia, were these guys, did they rule over India? No, they only ruled over 46%. They didn't even rule over majority. Only parts of the north, middle part, not even the south properly and not even the east properly as well of India. They didn't. Large parts of India were not conquered by the Mughals. Aurangzeb, who was the one that conquered the largest, had ruled over the largest portion, never had more than 55%. His father, who was Shah, Shah Jahan, who built the Taj Mahal, right? He only ruled over only about 45%. So Aurangzeb increased about 10% more. But even he did not rule over all of India. But Allah, Allah's Messenger said, last hour will not come until India is conquered. So therefore, this shows that therefore, a time will come when India will be conquered. That's the hadith of Rasulullah Another hadith of Rasulullah the Prophet said, the last hour will not come until Rome is conquered. Now Rome has never been conquered. Yes or no? Absolutely, Rome has never been conquered. He also said, last I will not come until Byzantine is conquered. When was Byzantine? So the Roman Empire, which is the Christian Empire, the Christian Empire were divided into East and West. There were two Roman, there were two Christian empires. One was the Eastern 
Empire, one was a Western Empire. The Eastern was called Byzantine. The Western is the Roman Empire, right? The Byzantine Empire was conquered 800 years ago, uh, 600 years ago, 800 years after the death of Rasulullah was conquered by Sultan Muhammad bin Al-Fatih, right? He conquered the Byzantine Empire and that's Istanbul, which is the head of the Byzantine Empire. But the Roman Empire is yet to be conquered. So the prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled. And you must believe it in your heart. This is why brothers and sisters have a lot of faith in Islam, especially to my young youth. In my audience over here, brothers and sisters, the young brothers and sisters, have faith in Allah. You know, have you guys, um, what can I tell you? I don't know, I didn't watch the soccer matches this, this time, so I can't, I can't use any of the soccer matches uh, as evidence. Uh, so I'm sorry, forgive me. <laughs> but uh, imagine, you know, you're, 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 you're in a soccer match and the opposing team has scored one goal, two goals, three goals. Right guys? Have scored a lot of goals. Yes, you need to score them back. But it's only half time. You're going to come back with blazing. You're going to come back guns blazing and the second half you're going to get four goals. And that's where we are at the moment, guys. It's only half time. It's only half time for Islam. Yes, we lost the first or we're losing the first half. Yes, that's right. But you know what? It's just going to make us stronger for the next one. We've learned our mistakes. We're not going to make the same mistakes. We're going to change and we're going to get better. Do you know, 50 years ago in Medina, has anyone been to Makkah, Medina? Hope, hopefully you have. Do you know our Sheikh, may Allah have mercy upon him, once I was in Medina, he said, I was like, Sheikh, what's happening with the women today? And he said, SubhanAllah, yani, you know, the hijab is getting tighter and you know, they're losing slowly, you know, uh, you know, niqab's coming off and then now it's the hijab's coming off and then even everything's starting to come off. And he said, you know what, Tawfiq, you guys are getting so impatient. You know, when I grew up in Medina, 50 years ago, when I grew up in Medina, women never even wore the hijab. They never had anything called the black hijab. Yeah. What the? So I said, what? Are you sure? He said, yes, I'm telling you. We used to see women completely normal. They were wearing their normal dresses. No one used to wear the hijab. No one covered their hair. No one, everyone wore makeup. Everyone wore perfume. No one was religious. Now you go to Saudi Arabia, you find a lot of religious people wearing the hijab and niqab and everything, right? In the same way, Ikhwani, when I was growing up, let me tell you my story. When I was growing up in Bangladesh, in my country, Bangladesh, when I was young, and I only lived there for a very short amount of time. I used to live in Saudi, I used to go back to Bangladesh for a holiday. I'm telling you, there was hardly a woman who would wear hijab. You know, Islam was mocked at. Islam was mocked at. General people used to mock Islam. They used to say, oh, how many shaitans are holding onto your beard? Anyone who had a beard, they'd mock them. This is how the people were. When I was growing up, do you know, a few years ago, I went back to Bangladesh. Oh my God, I can hardly look in a direction except there's a hundred women wearing hijab. I'm telling you, and it's very common to find women, women wearing niqab now. Something's going on. Something's going on. There is a revival. There is a revival. You know, recently, I was also speaking to some scholars here in Malaysia. Allah have mercy upon all the ulema of Islam. I was, sitting, I was speaking to some of the scholars in Malaysia and they were saying, you know, when we were growing up, no one even wore something called a hijab. Because I was saying, you know, what's the use of wearing a hijab and then you wear a, sh a tight shirt, tight pants? That's not, that's not Islamic principle, is it? I said, that's not Islamic principle. So the Sheikh was saying, you know, Abu Yusuf, when I was growing up, women didn't even wear the, that scarf even. Now, they, now it's so rare to not find anyone who's, except that they're wearing scarf. Correct? And on top of that now, I was with one of the printing and publishing companies here in Malaysia, and they were talking to us about how they were going to focus a lot on the Quran. And I said, that's very interesting. You guys are a secular company, secular media company. Why are you focusing so much on the Quran? He said, you don't understand what's happened in Malaysia. In Malaysia, there's a very strong turn towards religion. The youth are coming back in large numbers. And you know what? After Allah Azawajal, we have no one to thank except the West and their behavior with us. No one to thank after Allah Azawajal except the West and their behavior. Because I can tell you, we haven't done enough dawah to our own people. 
The only thing that's causing us to come back is the fact that, you know, we are seeing all these, all the, all, all, you know, our Islam being hijacked and Islam being hurt and our countries being taken over. So Allah is putting Islam and Izza and honor back into the hearts of the believers. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give this Izza and honor back to Islam and Muslimin. Ameen ya Rabb. Huwa alladhi arsala rasoolahu bil huda wa deen al haqqi li yudhhirahu ala deen kullihi wa kafa billahi shaheeda. Final verse. Final verse in Surah Al-Fatih. And mashallah, mashallah. Yani, um, uh, where are we? Yes, final verse. And what a beautiful verse it is. Listen to what Allah says. Muhammadun Rasulullah. Meaning Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam every time I say Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because when you say it, Allah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says Salah and Salam upon you ten times. Yes? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the messenger of Allah. Meaning he most definitely is the messenger of Allah. You have no doubt about it. وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ And those with him. Meaning now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to describe how Allah is so happy with the Sahaba. And this is why, you know, if you ever want to talk about those people who insult the Sahaba and say the Sahaba are disbelievers, etc. Read to them Surah Al-Fatih. Say how many verse after verse after verse. لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يُبَعْيُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةَ Huh? Verse after verse after verse where Allah says the tazkiyah of the Sahaba in this surah. This final verse also Allah does tazkiyah, tazkiyah meaning He raises the mention of the Sahaba and attests to their uprightness. He says, Muhammad Rasulullah walladina ma'ahu and those that are with him, ashidda'u ala al-kuffar. They are very severe with the kuffar, with the disbelievers. Khwani, this verse needs some explanation. The Sahaba were, were strong with the disbelievers. Yes, they were strong with the disbelievers as long as these disbelievers had rejected faith. As for those disbelievers that had not rejected faith, right, that were new to Islam, trying to find out, they would not be hard with them. They would be merciful and kind with them because that was by way of da'wah. Does that make sense? So yes, if you know of a disbeliever who has rejected faith, then it's fine to be hard but in general muslim non-muslims then your approach should be the way of da'wah da'wah means a cordial approach an inviting approach open the door for them pour the water for them tell them about islam does that make sense don't humble yourselves in front of them as if you're their slave but rather approach them out of kindness and mercy by way of da'wah and only once they have truly rejected faith then and only then you can say, you know what, I cut off my relationship with you. Does that make sense? Right. So why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying this hard with the disbelievers? Because it's in the context of the Quraysh. You see, this whole surah is in the context of the Quraysh, isn't it? Talking about the Quraysh, they were the ones that Allah talks about the kuffar. So yeah, they had rejected faith, absolutely. They had 13 years to accept faith, they didn't accept. So definitely they are disbelievers that deserved for the Muslim to be hard against them. Ashidda'u al-kuffar, ruhama'u baynahum. Very important verse. Ruhama'u baynahum. They are merciful to each other. Brothers and sisters in Islam, today we seem to be easy with the disbelievers, difficult with the believers. We must be more merciful with each other. You know what mercy is with each other? Excuses, dua, kindness, Gifts, inviting each other, yeah, friendship with each other. Today we are sometimes more merciful with disbelievers than we are with believers. Believers were sinned very hard. That brother, mm, I, don't, I don't like the way he's looking at me. I don't like the way he's sitting. Something wrong with him. Why are we so always against the believers? Why are we not merciful? That brother, he's a Wahhabi. Oh, you know, we use Wahhabi for anybody now. It's just like a, the common a swear word. Yeah, you don't like somebody? He doesn't look like you? Wahhabi. I mean, come on. Makes no sense. It makes no sense. You can't just call anyone any term. Guys, have mercy in your hearts. Mercy in your hearts. Ruhama ubaynahum. And that is why, Ikhwani, brothers and sisters of Islam, it was said that Abu Darda, one of the great Sahaba, 
he said, listen to this. He said, I make dua for 70 of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, my friends by name, every night. Every night he made dua for 70 of the Sahaba by name, every night. Ask yourself, do you make dua for your brothers or your sisters? Wallahi, we don't even make dua for our own brothers and sisters from blood relationships. Imagine now our friends amongst the Muslimin. This is what you call ra rahmah, mercy. Ruhama baynahum means when you hear about any of our Muslim countries in trouble, whether it be Syria, Palestine, Burma, whatever it is, then your heart bleeds like it bleeds when your family is in trouble. So ruhama baynahum, you love them like you love your own family. You care for them like you care for your own family. You, you give them money like you're going to give your own family. You buy them food and ensure they have food just like you have food. Ruhama baynahum. Ruhama baynahum, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters also means that you don't use this nationality card. You don't use anything to break yourselves up, whether it be color or race. Okay, you Indian, I'm Malay. You are British, I'm Australian. No, we don't use nationality nor race to break ourselves up. We are merciful to one another. Yeah? When someone comes asking for a daughter's hand in marriage, even if he's from a different tribe, from a different race, if he's a good man, we give him our daughter in marriage. Yes? Ruhama ubaynahum. We look after our orphans. We don't abandon our orphans. Do you know how many Muslim orphans there are now? Some of the scholars, uh, some of the charities estimated no less than 6 million Muslim orphans worldwide. 6 million. How many are we looking after at the moment? How many are we looking after? So, Ikhwani, it's time to look after our orphans. Ruhama abaynahum, merciful to each other. And we should be merciful to each other because Rasulullah SAW said so in the authentic hadith. Ar-Rahimuna yarhamhumullah. Irhamu man fil ard, yarhamukum man fil sama. Those who are merciful, Allah will have mercy on them. Have mercy on each other, Allah will have mercy on you. Ruhama ubaynahum. Tarahum rukka'an. You see them rukka'a, meaning doing rukur. Wasujjada and prostrating, meaning they are ruku and sujood, meaning they are standing, bowing or prostrating, always praying. Meaning whenever they get a chance, they pray. One of the special things about the believers is that they love their salah. They're always, you want to find somebody, go to the masjid, you'll find him there. It's time for dhuhr, yeah, where's the sheikh? Oh, you'll find him in the masjid. Where's that brother? Oh, don't worry. Don't worry, he doesn't have a phone or his phone stuff, but we know he'll be there at the masjid for dhuhr. Correct? Yeah. Tarahum rukka an sujada. You see them doing ruku and sujood. Yabtaguna fadlam min Allahi wa ridwana. Seeking the fadl, the blessings of Allah and His happiness. Meaning they do it out of pure pleasure. They don't do it out of anger or just because they're forced. They do it out of pure pleasure and love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His good pleasure. Seemahum fi wujuhihim min athari sujood. Seemahum, meaning the sign. Fi wujuhihim, on their faces. Min athari sujood is from the signs of prostration. Some of the scholars mention that this is the, the spot that you have on your head because of prostration. Other scholars mention this is the flushing of the face. You know when you bow down and the blood rushes to your face? Yeah? And then when you sit up, don't you suddenly feel the blood then blush brushing out of your body, out of your face? And you get this sudden feeling of peace and tranquility? Yes? This is the seema fi wujuhim in atharis sujood. Meaning as they prostrate a lot, as they come up, they have this peace and this look about them that is only because of the constant prostration and the length of the prostration. Seemahum fi wujuhi min athari sujood. Thalika matahum fi tawrah. That is their example. Also, one more opinion I forgot to mention. Is some of the ulama mentioned that seemahum fi wujuhi min athari sujood. When you bow and prostrate, then you are humbling yourself, right? So therefore, what is the sign on their face? It's the sign of humility. It's a sign of constant humility and humbleness. That they are not proud people. They don't brag, they don't boast. They are very humble 
and they're constantly worried about their acceptance of their deeds. After they do the deeds, they're worried about its acceptance. Before they do the deed, they're focused on its performance. That is the example that Allah has already mentioned about them in the Torah. So the Torah was actually available, the original Torah. This would have been described already who Muhammad was and who his companions would be. And their example in the Bible, on the other hand, in the Injil, Gospel, is like the example of a harvest. So when you put the harvest, the initial offshoots come out. Shata is the offshoots. You know, the initial offshoots that come out. These are the first offshoots that come out. Then it gets longer and stronger. Then it becomes thicker. Right? The harvest becomes thicker. The stock becomes thicker. Fastaglada means to become thick and hard. So it becomes fastaglada, fastawa ala suqih. So it stands up on its own branch, on its own stock. Yu'jibu zurra. Meaning, you remember when the stock starts coming out and it starts getting stronger and stronger. Every day the farmer comes, he looks at it like, wow. Next day he comes out, wow, look at that. Next it comes out bigger, wow, look at that. And he gets happier and happier and happier. Yu'jibu zurra. Meaning, fascinating the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning, that as Rasulullah ﷺ gave da'wah and knowledge, these believers started to have iman in their hearts and started to get better and stronger in their faith. Every day as they grew in their faith, the Prophet ﷺ got happier and happier looking at them. And that is why, يُعْجِبُ zurra, as some of the scholars said, on the last day on the Prophet ﷺ's death, when he passed away, on the last day, he opened the, the, the hut. He opened the curtain and he looked at the Sahaba and they were all standing up for Salah. They're all standing up. And the Sahaba said, we saw the Prophet Sallallahu and there was so much light on his face and we thought he was going to come out and lead the Salah. He smiled and looked at us and then he closed the curtain and he was never to open the curtain ever again because he passed away that day. But can you see how the Zurra is happy with his harvest? Yes or no? يُعْجِبُ zurra. Yeah, so he is the harvester and he is happy with his harvest. Yeah? يُعْجِبُ zurra. أَلْيَغِيضَ بِهِمُ الْلِيَغِيضَ بِهِمُ الْكُفَّارِ And so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may infuriate the disbelievers with them. You see, nothing infuriates the disbelievers like seeing believers being firm on their faith. The fact that you're becoming more righteous, brothers and sisters, infuriates those who truly disbelieve in Allah. So let's infuriate them even more. I say we make them even more angry. We, be, we get even more firmer on our faith. We get even more religious and righteous and practicing because this is what they, had they known what they're missing, they would have wanted the same thing. So I, I believe we should get stronger in our faith. And inshallah, we should also make our Mashaykh and ulama and our families who give us da'wah also happy just like the zurra who are happy with their harvest when it gets strong fastaghlada fastawa ala suqih upon its trunk yu'jibu zurra fascinating the farmers liyaghidha bihim al kuffar and so that he may infuriate the disbelievers with it wa'ada Allah alladhina amanu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised those who believe وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And do righteous deeds minhum from them مَغْفِرَةً Forgiveness وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا And a huge reward which is Jannah Huge reward أَجْرًا عَظِيمًا is Jannah Alhamdulillah Beautiful surah isn't it not so brothers and sisters? Beautiful surah What a beautiful ending What a beautiful ending And this is why brothers and sisters we should try to be like these Sahaba as well those who are ashidda wa al kuffar ruhama baynahum tarahum rukkaan sujjadan yabtaguna fadlan min Allah ridwana if you want to ask Allah don't just raise your hands we've got a bad habit we just raise our hands do it in your salah it's even more stronger because when you're in your ruku in your sujood you're closest to Allah isn't it you might as well just ask Allah in your, in your sujood you know you know when my child asks me and he's far away 
Dad, can I have the ice cream? It's not the same as Maryam coming and hugging me and kissing me and saying, Dad, can I have an ice cream? You know, which one am I more, more inclined to actually answer? The one when he is close to me, right? So come closer to Allah and ask him at that point. And that's what the Sahaba used to do. Ikhwani, it's very easy to start a good habit regarding Salah. Alhamdulillah, hopefully with the Qiyam and the, and the Tahajjud and the uh, Taraweeh, we are beginning to love our night prayer. It's also very easy to do that. After every single wudu, pray two rakahs. When you go to your office, pray two rakahs. I used to have a habit that when I used to ride my car, and usually from my house to my, to my university was 15 minutes, I used to pray two rakahs in my, in, my, in my car. Because the Prophet ﷺ would pray sunnah or nafal on his riding beast. So we know it is sunnah, it's allowed for you to pray sunnah whilst you're driving. Yeah, you don't have to take your eyes off the road. Please don't, don't die. Okay, look straight. You look straight, no problem. Mafi, mafi bus. But you can also still drive, especially long roads. The Prophet used to let his camel ride and he would say, Allahu Akbar, on the camel, sitting on the camel. And that's why the scholars such as Imam An-Nawi rahimahullah, he said, it is permissible for you to pray on your riding beast, whichever that is, even if you're riding the car, even if that means moving your head, because the, the camel would move everywhere, right? Camel wouldn't just point towards Kaaba, he would move. So it doesn't matter, even if you're facing away from the Qibla, no problem. Yes? As long as not the obligatory prayer. As long as not the obligatory prayer. So what I'm trying to say, Ikhwani, increase the number of prayers. One day a Sahaba came to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, Make dua to Allah for me. He said, what, would you want, what do you want me to ask Allah for, for you? He said, make dua to Allah that I be with you on the, in the day of judgment. That I be with you in Jannah. Yeah, what a beautiful dua, right? So look at what Rasulullah said. He said, لَقَدْ سَعَلْتَ عَنْ عظيم. You have asked me for a great thing. Massive dua. Yani already entering Jannah is difficult. On top of that, to be my companion in Jannah, Oh, that's massive. Then listen to what he said. He said, "Aini bi sujood." Help my du'a be accepted by Allah by praying a lot, by prostrating a lot to Allah. Yeah. So we've got to fall in love with our salah, brothers and sisters. Just fall in love with your salah. Don't miss your tahajjud. Don't miss your sunnah prayers. Don't miss your salat al-duha, which is just after the sun rises. You know salat al-duha. The Prophet said the authentic hadith and say Muslim. You know what he said? He said there are 360 bones in every single body and a sadaqah is due from every one of them. Okay, how are you going to pay for your bones in your body and your joints in your body? Then listen to what he said. The next rest of the hadith, he said, so whoever prays his salat al duha, then he has given the shukr for all his, all his blessings for that day. So salat al duha, is the shukur, the thanks, the sadaqah, the charity for the 370 bones in our body, the sadaqah that is due for the whole day. So pray your salat al-duha. 15 minutes after sunrise, very easy. 15 minutes after sunrise, up to half an hour before duha, before salat, salat al-duhur, duhar salah, duhar adhan, right? So until about, what would you say? Uh, 15 minutes after sunrise, sunrise is about 7.05. So let's say 7, 7.30, let's say, okay? 705, 708, something like that, right? 720, 730. That's from then on, you can pray just two rakahs even, or eight rakahs, which is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, to pray eight, or pray at least two, minimum two, anything, just two rakahs. That's it, that's enough. Uh, pray two rakahs, and then all the way till 1, 1 p.m. here in Malaysia, because Dhuhr is at 1.30, right? Or 129, whatever it is, so it's at one at one o'clock, finish your salat al-duha before one o'clock. Every day, practice this. In the authentic hadith, Abu Hurair radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, Awsani khalili. Listen to what he said. Awsani khalili. Khalili. He said, my khalil, meaning, what does khalil mean? My bosom buddy, my best friend. The one I love more than anything else. Rasulullah sallallahu Awsani, he told me. Meaning he, he asked me, he said, if you can never ever leave your salat al-duha, 
If you can, never leave your Salat al-Duha, right? Never leave it. Also, Witr Salah. Never leave your Witr, Ikhwani. The Prophet said in authentic hadith, he said, Laysa minna man lam yutir. He is not from us, the one who doesn't do Witr Salah. Right? And Allah Witr, you hibbul Witr. Allah is one and He loves the odd prayer. Right? So pray, Ikhwani. And that's why Imam Ahmed Rahimullah used to say, Bi'sa rajulin sula yaqumul layl. What an evil man is the one who does not pray at night. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those people who love our salah and those who become like the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ashidda kuffar ruhama baynahum always asking Allah in our ibadat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us worthy followers of these people and join us together. Al mar'u ma'aman ahab. Oh Allah, we make you a witness that we love you and we love your Prophet. And we love Abu Bakr, and we love Umar, and we love Uthman, we love Ali, we love all the Sahaba Ajma'een. And may Allah raise us up with them on the day of judgment. Ameen, Ya Rabb. Wa akhiru da'wana, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Brothers and sisters, uh, tomorrow we will have our tafsir, inshaAllah. Tomorrow. And then, so tomorrow is Wednesday, so tomorrow again 6 p.m. Thursday and Friday, there will be no tafsir sessions. Thursday and Friday because it's a, it's a night of power conference. If you go to nightofpower.org, sign up uh, for the conference. There's 20 world-renowned world, world, uh, speakers and mashayikh and ulama who will be delivering this Ramadan Night of Power Laylatul Lay Qadr conference. Uh, and alhamdulillah, best lectures, best people on the best night, mashallah. So it'll help you to, uh, to energize yourself, inshallah. Yeah? So on the Thursday and Friday, no classes because of the conference. Saturday and Sunday, inshallah, there'll be, there'll be tafsir, okay? And that'll be the last three. So there's three more classes left. Wednesday, which is tomorrow, and then Saturday, and then Sunday will be the last days, inshallah. And these, with, do, with these two days, inshallah, we will finish off our tafsir of the Quran, bi'ithnillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from us. Wa akhiru da'wana, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, ameen, ya rabbi.